Welcome to week two of computational algebraic topology. If you made it all the way to the end of last week's lectures, then you should have the following picture somewhere in the back of your minds. Um, we have some subset of Rn, which is unknown. And we have lots of sample points, which are known. and sort of near x, whatever that means. Um, I guess we can make that precise. They're, they're no more than epsilon away from uh, x. OK, so um, then we wanted to build simplicial complexes to understand the union of epsilon balls around these data points that we do have. Uh, this looks bad. We seem to be missing a chunk of x, so I'm going to add a data point there. And OK, now it looks sort of reasonable. Uh, well, so let's see. There are, there are sort of three spaces uh, that you might want to keep track of. Uh, the first one is x, which of course we want to find, but we don't know. Um, then there is. Uh, the union of balls around M at various scales epsilon. So this is the unknown space. This is the union of balls. Um, and what else? Well, the third space you might want to keep in mind is um, is the, the, the geometric realization of the simplicial complex or the filtrations that we use to approximate it. So the, the, the two that we saw were, you know, F equals via torus rips or F equals check. So these two we've talked about, but, you know, in general, you could put any sort of family of uh, simplicial complexes that are getting larger and larger. And the problem, um, the reason we're doing everything we're about to do is that in general, all three will have different dimensions. Which is to say, um, the dimension of x in this case is 1, right? It's just a curve. I've drawn it sort of as a one-dimensional object. Great. Um, so that's 1. Uh, the dimension of the union of balls is always n. And, and if you think about this as living in three-dimensional space, then, then the dimension of the union of epsilon balls, because we're growing those balls in three-dimensional space, has to be three. It's a union of sort of three-dimensional solid objects. So the dimension of x and the dimension of the union of balls uh, that we're using to approximate x uh, are not the same. That's sort of annoying. Uh, what's even worse is that if you try to build a check or Vitoris rips complex around these these points at this illustrated scale where they do seem to be approximating at least the taken version of X nicely, well, it turns out that's not going to have dimension one or three. I think uh, the largest intersection I see is three balls are intersecting at once. Uh, maybe for example over here, so you'd get, you know, that two simplex. So, so. In the picture that I have drawn, the dimension of x is 1. Uh, the dimension of the union of balls is 3. In fact, it could be whatever larger thing. But let's imagine this whole thing is living in R3. I mean, this is n. And the dimension of the check complex or the Vietoris rips complex is going to be 2. Um, and one of the bad things that happens is uh, they cannot be homeomorphic to each other. They can't be homeomorphic. So this is unfortunate. If you've only seen homeomorphism in your points at topology courses, assuming you've had a topology course, um, you this is a very, very unsatisfactory state of affairs. I mean, we said we would build this topological approximation to a topological object, and it turns out that the one uh, equivalence relation you have between different topological objects, which is are they homeomorphic to each other or not, is not going to be a good detector of whether we've done a good job in our approximation. 
So this drives the need to find um, equivalences between topological spaces that are even squishier than homeomorphism. So we need a weaker notion of equivalence between topological spaces. And that's what we are going to talk about for this entire week. Uh, the the notion that we have in mind is uh, is that of homotopy equivalence. If you've seen it before, great. If you haven't seen it before, no need to panic. We will go over it uh, carefully and introduce everything we need uh, during the course of this week. So the first thing to know about is when two functions are put in the same bucket when they are when they're in the same equivalence class. So two functions, continuous functions. Let's call them f and g between topological spaces x and y are homotopic, uh, and we'll denote this by f squiggly g because it's a squiggly relationship. Our, so these are homotopic if there exists a third continuous function. Uh, let's call it theta, and this time it's not going from x to y. It's going from x cross the unit interval to y, satisfying two conditions. The first condition it must satisfy is that if the um, so theta of x zero. So you have a, 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 a it's defined on a product. So there's an X term and then there's something living between zero and one. When that thing is slid all the way to zero, this, this variable living between zero and one, then you recover F. And at the other end, you will be hopefully not surprised to know that at the other end, when that thing is, you slide it all the way up to one, you get G of X. Again, so this is for all X in X. This is also for all x and x. That's it. That's the definition of when two functions f and g are homotopic. Now, it's good to keep in mind certain examples. Um, we will see various examples of homotopies, and, and uh, so this theta is called a homotopy. Between f and g. So we will see examples of homotopies, but it's good to already have a few uh, sort of canonical pictures in mind. So let's give you an example where x is the unit interval and y is r2. So um, here's x and here's y. Um, okay, so let's draw a map. Um, what would a map f from x to r2 look, look like? Well, a continuous map. Uh, maybe it looks something like this. Um, okay. And now here is another copy of x. And let's draw another map g. It looks like that. Um, and what this relationship is, um, is saying is that when you cross um, this x with the unit interval again, and you get x cross 0, 1, which is going to be that entire square, you can extend, you can find a new continuous map defined not just on the top edge and the bottom edge, but on this entire square, this closed unit square, which is x cross 0, 1. So maybe I should write this is the x direction, this is the 0, 1 direction. Uh, you can find an entire um, continuous function that that sends that square into, uh, into R2 so that the top edge is F and the bottom edge is G. Um, you can make this fancier. I mean, um, here X and zero, one are the same, but in general, X could be, for instance, a circle, in which case um, this X cross zero, one would be a cylinder, and then you could embed a cylinder in, in, 
uh, R3 or something like that. Okay, so um, this is one uh, picture to keep in mind. So, so really, there's a um, if you remember the the lecture on Butorus rips filtrations and check filtrations, there was a slider that decided what the radius of the balls was uh, that you were considering um, to connect with simplices. And here, again, there is a slider. There's a slider. You just think of a T as living between 0 and 1. When T is equal to 0, you have F. When T is 1, you have G. And that's it. Um, that's the definition of when two functions are homotopic. Um, so. What I promised you was an equivalence relation between topological spaces. What I've delivered is an equivalence relation between functions. So there's one more step. Two topological spaces, x and y, are, and here is the key notion, homotopy equivalent. If there exist continuous maps and be careful about the directions there's f going from x to y and y oops not y g going back from y to x which is very different from what the two continuous maps in the definition upstairs were doing they're both going in the same direction from x to y here, f goes forward and g goes backwards. Um, so there exists continuous maps, one forward, one back, satisfying. Again, two conditions. The first one is that when you do first f and then g, so f is going to take you from x to y, g is going to bring you back to x. This has to be homotopic to the identity map on x. So this is the identity which does nothing, it just sends x, every point in x to itself. And uh, again, no prizes for guessing the second criterion, uh, that's the other composite has to be uh, homotopic to uh, the identity map on y. So this is what it takes for, um, for two topological spaces to be homotopy equivalent. Now, it's, um, uh, people tend to underestimate this the first time they see it. The definition looks not very scary. Uh, but the trouble is um, all these there exists floating around. Uh, if someone just hands you two topological spaces, even if they're just simplicial complexes, it is extremely difficult to find out whether these maps exist or not. Um, it's not an easily computable thing. But the good news Um, and I'm not I'm not showing you a proof here or anything. Is that um, homotopy is dimension agnostic? So the problem we were having before about uh, homeomorphism uh, would never work between these three spaces that we really want to compare because they don't have the same uh, dimension. Um, this this curve. And uh, this thick inversion, um, they're going to be homotopy equivalent. And, and near the end of uh, this series of lectures, we will develop the tools uh, which help us decide whether or not two spaces are homotopy equivalent. So I wouldn't worry too much about how to prove anything with homotopy right now. Think of it like jumping headfirst into the deep end of an icy cold pool just so that the, the shock hits you all at once. So, okay. Now, um, there are a few sorts of um, uh, uh, procedural things to keep in mind. Uh, so this was part A of the note. Part B is uh, we call two simplicial complexes um, let's say K and L homotopy equivalent. I mean, this is the obvious thing, right? We have a way to take a simplicial complex and look at it as a topological space, which is geometric realization. So when we say two simplicial complexes are homotopy equivalent, what we really mean 
is that their geometric realizations are homotopy equivalent in the sense of the definition above. Um, if their geometric realizations K and L are homotopy equivalent in the sense above. Good. So, um, well, in light of all of this information, our new goal is going to be to study simplicial complexes up to homotopy equivalents. Which is to say that um, if this is our goal, this is our adjusted goal, our, our, um, our naive initial goal might have been to study simplicial complexes up to uh, homeomorphism, see when they're classifying, um, when their uh, geometric realizations are homeomorphic to each other. Uh, but that is not going to accord with our goals of studying um, uh, finite data sets because we always get the wrong dimension if we do that. And homeomorphism is very, very rigid about what the intrinsic dimension of the space is supposed to be. Uh, so now we're going to relax the notion of equivalence from homeomorphism to homotopy, build the required machinery to detect when, uh, to get tools to detect when things are homotopy equivalent, and then try and see whether one of our filtrations at some scale is going to give us um, at least homotopically the correct answer. Uh, when compared to an unknown uh, space from which those points were sampled. Great. See you in the next lecture.